So now in this next video, we're going to finish up looking at the cellular components of blood by entitling the next flowchart, Cellular Components 2. And we want to, what we want to continue speaking about now are the erythrocytes. So let's do that over here. So we'll start with the erythrocytes and we'll continue speaking about them. So erythrocytes continued. So what, do we, what else do we want to say about these red blood cells? Again, the thing that I left off of in the last video was the fact that they must transport oxygen. That's their number one job, to carry oxygen and to transport oxygen. That's the purpose of a red blood cell, primarily, let's say. And how can it possibly do this? In order to do this, it utilizes a very important protein. Red blood cells utilizes a protein known as hemoglobin. And this is commonly abbreviated as Hb. So what we have here is going to be specifically an O2 transport protein. This is a very uh, hierarchical protein with a quaternary structure, very advanced structure, very nicely designed structure for O2 transport. So it's an O2 transport protein that's found within, it's part of the red blood cell's structure. So it will contain a hemoglobin within a red blood cell. And the whole purpose of this is to carry oxygen to the right place. We don't need to get into the specific mechanisms of how oxygen is carried and delivered, but we just need to understand that hemoglobin is the molecule, is the protein that does the crux of the oxygen transport and carrying and delivery. In addition, hemoglobin, because of this heme group that it has, it's an iron group, that's what gives blood its red color. That's what gives blood a red color. Okay, good thing to know. In addition, what we also want to understand about erythrocytes is this uh, responsibility of transporting oxygen and how that transport of oxygen is sort of regulated. Specifically, I want to focus now on the idea of erythrocyte production. How do we know when to make more erythrocytes or maybe less erythrocytes depending on the situation? And that's what we'll focus on here, erythrocyte production. This is going to be controlled by a hormone, much like anything else. So this is controlled and regulated by a hormone called EPO hormone. EPO hormone. EPO hormone stands for erythropoietin. So what is EPO going to do? EPO is going to specifically be produced as it's a tropic hormone. It's going to be produced by the kidney. So it starts at the kidney and has to travel somewhere to have an effect. That's why it's tropic. So EPO is produced by the kidney, and it's going to be produced via a negative feedback sort of system. So let's write this down. Negative feedback system that's going to be sensitive to the following. It's produced by the kidney via negative feedback, sensitive, it's able to detect to the amount of oxygen so how much oxygen is going to be reaching the tissues? So basically, we have two scenarios to focus on to see how EPO is going to influence those scenarios. So let's repeat. EPO, which is the protein that controls how many erythrocytes are produced or how they're made, it's going to be made at the kidney. And via a negative feedback sen sensitive system, it's going to detect how much O2 is reaching the tissues. So basically, if we have, let's say, not enough O2 reaching tissues, we're going to have a negative feedback response. That's basically going to be the opposite response. In order to combat not enough O2 being reached at the tissues, we're going to make sure that more O2 reaches the tissues, meaning that we're going to make more erythrocytes via this EPO message. So what do we have? We have the kidney, which is the organ in question that produces doesn't produce red blood cells directly. What it does, it produces more, that's the negative feedback here, EPO. Negative feedback because it's just doing the opposite of what's happening. There's not enough O2, so we need more erythrocytes because there's not enough erythrocytes. So the kidney produces more EPO, and the EPO is going to tropically go somewhere. The EPO stimulates, this is the message that tells the place where erythrocytes come from, and that's the bone marrow, of course. EPO stimulates BM for bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. The kidney does not produce more red blood cells. 
The blood does not produce more red blood cells, but the bone marrow is told to produce more RBC if it gets an EPL message. The EPL message only comes if the kidney makes EPL. The kidney only makes EPL if there's not enough oxygen. So again, please keep in mind the following statement. It's very important to keep this in mind. The kidney nor the EPO, both of these are not, they're absolutely not making red blood cells. Who's making the red blood cells? The bone marrow. But the bone marrow is only being told to make the red blood cells by the EPL. The EPL is only coming because the kidney has made the EPL. Understand that, that the direct synthesis of red blood cells is only and exclusively by the bone marrow and the bones that we talked about, the marrow of the bones that are specifically mentioned. So that's the situation if there's not enough oxygen. What if we do the opposite of that? What if there's too much oxygen delivery? What if tissues are getting too much oxygen? This is certainly possible because it's a negative feedback system. If this is too much oxygen, well, it's very simple. You just do the opposite of everything we just talked about. The kidney produces less EPO. If the kidney is producing less EPO, less erythropoietin hormone, that would mean that the bone marrow is getting less of a message to do what? The bone marrow, specifically, because of this less EPO response, produces less red blood cells. And that's exactly how we would expect a negative feedback to work. So that covers our look at erythrocytes. Two more cellular components to briefly go over. In addition to the red blood cells, erythrocytes that are found within blood, in addition to that, we also have what are known as leukocytes. Leukocytes are going to also be known as WBCs, white blood cells. These are going to generally be, for right now, we'll just state that they are going to be specialized, differentiated to defend against pathogens. They are our pathogen defense mechanism. They are part of the immune system to defend against pathogens. Pathogens are just foreign invaders. And in addition, because they're defending against pathogens, they are actually going to be uh, able to go throughout the body, meaning that they are not confined, even though they're a part of the circulation and the blood, they're not confined to the blood. Therefore, they're not confined to the circulatory system as a circulatory fluid. Red blood cells are. Red blood cells can only stay within the red blood. They can only stay there. But white blood cells have this capability of going outside of the circulatory system. Specifically, they have the capability as white blood cells to go into, let's say, the interstitial fluid if need be. And they also have the capability of going into the lymph nodes if need be. And that's why they have a little bit more accessibility to the rest of the body. Finally, the last, we'll talk more about white blood cells and immunity as we move forward in this lecture. The last cellular component I want to talk about within blood are platelets. So we talked about red blood cells, we talked about white blood cells, the last cellular component are platelets. Platelets are actually themselves not whole cells. They are just fragments of cells. Specifically, they are pinched off cytoplasmic fragments, pinched off cytoplasmic fragments that come from the bone marrow as well, but specifically from uh, large bone marrow cells, of large bone marrow cells. So they, just like white blood cells, just like red blood cells, come from the bone marrow because that's where blood comes from, but they are pinched off cytoplasmic fragments of bone marrow. They also contain no nuclei because they don't need the nucleus because their number one job will be in blood clotting. And that's going to be a focus in the next flowchart and as we continue speaking about the idea and role of blood. Blood clotting will be what we focus on next.